So in this lecture, uh, we are going to look at a very important reaction known as the electrophilic uh, aromatic substitution. We already have a good idea about uh, the way aromatic systems are going to react. And uh, so we will now look at some of these uh, reactions in detail. So in the past uh, couple of introductory lectures, we have seen the value of NMR both proton NMR as well as carbon NMR and um, and how it is very useful for us to uh, to understand uh, structure of molecules and what is the local environment etc. So now what I am going to do in the next uh, minute or so, couple of minutes or so is to describe you know an NMR experiment that we do. Okay. So what we do is we take uh, basically uh, phenol whose structure is shown here it's benzene with an hydroxyl group and we dissolve it in D2O. Okay, D2O is basically deuterated water and deuterated water and uh, you know the concept that we need to understand which I will now discuss is that deuterium is NMR silent. Okay, which means that under the conditions under which you do proton NMR uh, recording of a proton NMR spectrum, a deuterium is silent. So once you replace a hydrogen with deuterium, that uh, peak will disappear. Okay. So when you add a phenol into D2O, the pK of phenol is a little bit above uh, around maybe 9, 9, 10 or so. And so in D2O, what happens is that there is an equilibrium that is set up between this phenol and uh, phenoxide. And right O minus and uh, and once this equilibrium is set up, when it picks up the deuterium, it goes back to it goes to OD rather than OH. Okay, so of course this is also going to be an equilibrium in this reaction. So uh, gradually phenol gets completely converted to. Uh, deuterated phenol. So in the NMR spectrum, the, the peak that, that you would expect for OH uh, does not show up and uh, so you see uh, only the remainder of the peaks. Now coming to the remainder of the molecule, let us uh, look at this one by one. Okay, So when you look at phenol, this position, uh, let me just number the carbon so that it is easy for us to follow it. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Okay, So in carbon uh, number 1 where the hydroxyl group is there, there is no hydrogen. So there is no uh, nothing to worry about here. Uh, when we look at uh, carbon 2, there is a hydrogen attached to it which I have shown in red. Okay, And you will see that uh, there is a plane of symmetry in this molecule and uh, this plane of symmetry uh, sort of which I am going to just draw like this sort of cuts the molecule into two okay and therefore uh, this part of the molecule the left hand side of the molecule is identical to the right hand side of the molecule okay so the one the, that I have circled now these two hydrogens are the same so the chemical environment is the same and therefore they also show up in the NMR as a single peak. The magnetic environment is also the same. Now the next set of, uh, of hydrogens which are in green are also the same. Okay, And lastly there is one hydrogen here that I am showing in the form of a square that is a single hydrogen anyway and it is distinct from the other hydrogens. The other way to think about it is that if I assume that from benzene I am making phenol in my mind, uh, the hydrogen here is close to the phenol and therefore the environment that it's going to that it's going to experience is going to be different from this hydrogen here, which is a little bit far away from the phenol. And lastly, this hydrogen is in the four position and therefore it must be experiencing a very different environment. And among these three hydrogens, not just the phenol, but you know this hydrogen is next to uh, the pink hydrogen here and this hydrogen here, I mean the hydrogen is also next to this hydrogen here. Whereas this red hydrogen is only next to the phenol and the other hydrogen. So there are many differences that you can sort of systematically work out. 
But at the end of it, what we realize is that the phenol uh, in uh, uh, D2O okay, has three distinct uh, signals that we would expect to see. Okay, which I am going to label here as uh, HA, HB and HC. Okay, so just to be clear about the numbering, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Okay, so you are going to see three signals in the NMR spectrum. I'm not going to draw out the NMR spectrum because it's a little complicated, you know, and uh, we have not done coupling, for example, in NMR. So that will be reserved for an advanced course. But suffice to say that uh, you do see uh, three signals in D2O. Okay. Uh, now the experiment that we want to do is we take phenol or deuterated phenol in I mean in, in D2O okay and add some amount of D plus okay D plus is basically the equivalent of H plus except except that it is a deuterium okay now as we just uh, discussed this then you record the NMR spectrum it's an NMR experiment and what you expect to see is essentially the peaks that you expect to see are this OH is going to be replaced by OD so you, that becomes NMR silent. Now the HA, HB and HC are the three peaks that you expect to see. Okay. However, when you go and record the NMR spectrum what ends up happening is that you don't see a peak for HA and you don't see a peak for HC but you only see a peak for HB. Now remember that we discussed about the formation, the replacement of, of hydrogen by deuterium and how that's going to have an effect on the absence of a signal. So if a deuterium replaces hydrogen then it's going to become NMR silent. So one possible uh, interpretation from this experiment is that under these conditions this is actually forming a molecule like this. Okay, so what happens if I just uh, draw out the original structure that we had was OD, H, H, H. So as we discussed this A, B and C. So now this A is replaced by deuterium, C is replaced by deuterium and so therefore you have only one signal in the NMR spectrum when you add D2 on D+. Okay. So this is a very important experiment because this tells us that A there is a substitution reaction that is happening. Okay, so first of all, the aromatic ring is involved, so therefore, it's an aromatic reaction. The second key term is the substitution that is happening. So you have a deuterium that is replacing hydrogen, and therefore, it is a substitution reaction. So as a reaction, we are going to call it as an aromatic substitution reaction. Now, the mechanism of the reaction or the way in which the reaction happens, uh, we will understand that it's actually an electrophilic aromatic substitution. So now let's uh, try and understand uh, the mechanism of this reaction. So before we get into the details of the mechanism, let me introduce another reaction to you. So you all must be familiar that if we start with uh, a cyclohexene and add uh, bromine to it, we get this 1,2-dibromo compound and this is a very 
standard reaction that uh, we're all quite familiar with. Similarly, you know, if you uh, start with a per acid uh, such as MCPBA, okay, we end up with the corresponding uh, epoxide. Okay, so these are all fairly well established reactions of olefins. But when we do the same or uh, expose benzene to the same reaction conditions, okay, that is bromine or MCPPA, there's absolutely no reaction. Okay, so benzene is fairly stable and it really doesn't uh, do the kind of reactions uh, sometimes that uh, olefins do very easily. Okay, uh, you also would have studied it as a, as a very special property of uh, aromatic compounds, which is that 4n plus 2 pi electrons, etc. Okay, so now how do we get uh, benzene to undergo uh, bromination? Uh, if we want to do that, then what we need to do is basically take bromine and add uh, some Lewis acid like aluminium chloride. And uh, this reaction goes fairly well. You get the product which is bromobenzene. Okay. Now, if I look at this reaction, uh, we can clearly say that this is an aromatic substitution reaction as we discussed in the previous case. Okay, because the hydrogen uh, here is being replaced by bromine. Okay, now here comes the question about the mechanism. Okay, so uh, in order to understand the mechanism, let's first move to the uh, to the reaction where uh, we had the olefin. Okay, so you are all familiar with the bromination reaction. So you have Br, Br, and then this you can push arrows here, and you get to the cyclic bromonium ion. Uh, which then eventually gives you the dibromo product okay through the addition of br minus okay so now similarly so this is called an electrophilic addition reaction because if you see the bromine has actually added on to the olefin here so this is an electrophilic 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 because the olefin is reacting or the carbon based uh, group is reacting as an electrophile so therefore it's an electrophilic addition reaction okay and uh, it's also uh, you know it's also called as bromination epoxidation whatever those reactions they are all come under electrophilic addition reactions but the important point here is that there is an electrophile that is produced which is essentially Br plus. Okay, So this is important that we understand because the active reacting group is not bromide but it is Br plus. Okay? Now coming back to the aromatic substitution reaction that we have just encountered. So in the case where we add Br2 and AlCl3, uh, what we can propose based on our knowledge of chemistry so far is that we can say that the Br, which has a pair of electrons, can coordinate with AlCl3. Okay. Once this coordination happens, it is going to produce a complex such as this, where you have Al. Cl3 and uh, you're going to have uh, uh, a full positive charge on Br and a negative charge on aluminium and uh, what can happen is that this produces a, a very uh, reactive species. Okay, So this is the reactive electrophile that's going to react. Now let me uh, move to the next uh, slide where we can discuss this uh, in bit of detail so let me just draw out the benzene ring and here is your uh, br br and al cl3 so there's a negative charge on aluminium there's a positive charge on br because br is donating electrons to aluminium now this is set up beautifully to do the electrophilic aromatic 
a substitution reaction here is where it attacks and then this kicks out this leaving group here okay so what i will do now is i'll just number these carbons so that it's easy for us to follow this is one two three four five and six okay so if we just redraw the benzene ring the way it is now what what is going on here is the bond between one and two is being broken and a new bond between two and br is being formed so let me just draw out the new bond br and as you can very clearly see the byproduct is br al cl3 and it has a negative charge because once this lone pair goes here there's still a negative charge that's remaining okay so the bond between carbon 2 and bromine is being formed and there's the bond between 1 and 2 that is broken and that would result in a full positive charge on carbon 1 okay the remaining uh, bonds will continue because you will get you know the other double bonds are going to remain and keep in mind that this hydrogen over here remains at the two position so let me just draw this hydrogen out as well so that it's easy for us to follow it so this is carbon one two three four and so on so these two hydrogens i mean all the hydrogens remain intact so far hydrogen has not been lost okay so this is the step where this is called the addition of e plus which is the electrophile okay the next step which i'm going to draw out here the next step is the elimination reaction which is a loss of a proton so let's look at that step now so i'm essentially drawing the same structure that i drew in the previous page there's a positive charge here keep in mind that this is one two three four five and six and um, you know there's a double bond here there's a double bond here and uh, there are resonating forms that we can look at later but now imagine that uh, there is either a bromide or water or something in the system that comes and attacks here and produces uh, reforms the double bond then the product that you get is this bond remains the same this bond remains the same br carbon bromine bond remains the same and there's a new bond that has been formed here and hbr is lost okay this could also be water or it could be any other nucleophile or base okay so uh, if you see if you look at here closely uh, you should you should be very careful with this because the numbering is very important so I'm just keeping the numbering the same just so that we understand the uh, uh, the reaction outcome. So there's now a bond that's been formed between carbon 1 and carbon 2. That is a double bond. All right. Uh, so this is actually the, is an elimination reaction. Okay. So therefore, this substitution reaction is actually a combination of the substitution is equal to addition plus elimination okay so uh, so that's why this reaction mechanism is quite unique okay now coming to the resonance forms so if i take a general structure such as this e and h and uh, i'm just going to stick to the same numbering or i'll just uh, change this is one two three four five six and uh, the positive charge is here the double bond here double bond here okay so now you could draw a resonance form wherein i'm just going to put this positive charge outside so that it's easy for us to follow and this becomes carbon one okay so one way to draw a resonance form is to push this electrons over here okay so when you push the electrons over there uh, the resulting structure 
uh, has exactly the same structure except that there's a new double bond that's being formed here and there will be a positive charge here this double bond remains intact okay so just to complete the numbering this is one two three four five and six okay and lastly if you push these electrons over here then you have a full positive charge here e h and so on okay so again if i keep stick to the same numbering one two three four five and six okay so these are the resonance forms that could uh, happen in the intermediate that sort of stabilizes the positive charge that is present okay now let's look at uh, a slightly different reaction which is basically the the nitration reaction so again this is something that we might have encountered earlier uh, in our previous courses but it's a very important reaction that we understand so when we add hno3 and h2so4 the product that we get here is nitro benzene okay so uh, let me just quickly uh, write out the structure of hno3 all right now what happens uh, is that uh, this picks up a proton from uh, likely from h2so4 so 3h uh, okay and uh, the product that is formed is actually n double bond o oh2 plus oh and uh, you can push arrows for water to leave and the electrophile that is going to be produced is n double bond o double bond o h plus okay so you know the other way to uh, if this is going to lose a proton then the electrophile that uh, you're going to produce would be is a full positive charge here sorry about that the electrophile that is going to be produced is uh, no2 plus okay now uh, this no2 plus is the active uh, nitrating agent and uh, the reaction that uh, it can undergo it can uh, mediate is the reaction with the benzene ring so let's now draw that out and double bond o double bond o plus this can attack here and this moves up and you get H N double bond O O minus and this nitrogen continues to have a positive charge because this it has four bonds and there is a full positive charge on this carbon. These two bonds remain the same. Okay. Now, as we discussed earlier, you can propose that a base of some sort, which could be HSO3 minus, for example, comes in, picks up this proton. And the final product that you're going to get is nitro benzene. Okay, so this is a fairly straightforward reaction mechanism once we have understood the basics.